The milestone, um, the, the, the event that changed sort of the earthquake of microfinance was um, in um, April of 2007, five years ago, uh, Compertamos in Mexico did an IPO. They had already been making very large profits. Uh, you know, they, they, the, the figure we used, the return on investment, return on equity was over 50% every year, year after year after year for about seven years. How do you do that? Charging women over 100% and making very large profits, uh, 50% again. And so that that's what got the attention of the investment world. And so th a very different kind of money started to flow in, might even argue flood into microfinance. After the question was asked, the CEO attempted to answer the question, but was very caught off guard. He didn't know what to say. He was, he was completely shocked at the question and tried to try to explain it but really was was unable and at a certain point one of the the panelists I, I forget whether it was triple jump or ASN stood up and called an immediate coffee break I was offered a pay rise to continue working for them as a consultant on the condition that I signed a series of additional confidentiality clauses, very restrictive confidentiality clauses, preventing me from discussing anything with anyone ever, basically. Um, and I was also given seven days to sign this letter and return it. Otherwise, they would seek to fire me by taking me to court in Holland. So Triple Jump wanted to shut you up? It was pretty clear that they wanted to shut me up. The bottom line is simply that there is a mass exploitation happening um, and I just eventually tired of this and something had to be done um, and I'm prepared to suffer the consequences of that because I think that's what is required to do to clean up this sector. And now he has a book. Geschreven. I believe that for microfinance to be effective, the interest rates charged to the poor have to be much lower than they currently are. They have to be genuinely reasonable in order to give the poor a fighting chance of actually growing their businesses. Now, the problem with such interest rates is that lower interest rates mean lower profit. Lower profit means investors are less willing to invest. The problem with microfinance is if you want to do it well and effectively, it's not super profitable. The Opmars. I remember walking out and giving that first $200 to a shoemaker, a male shoemaker, and wondering if and how he might ever return that money. And uh, the, he never missed a payment, and all the rest of the clients, almost nobody ever missed a payment. It was, um, it was uh, in many ways uh, startling. You know, we expected defaults. We expected people to struggle, and instead we found mysteriously almost the exact opposite. The idea, oh, this is the magic bullet. Um, wow, here we were saying, you know, wow, okay, here's a, you know, we're loaning, we're not giving anything. We're making a loan, we're teaching people some training, and we're getting all the loan money back, and that was seen as really exciting because the poor were benefiting by our beliefs, and the institution was, would not need to continue, would not need to depend on grants to stay alive and continue to help more and more uh, of the poor. The poor around the world are almost, are the vast majority of them are self-employed. There's no safety net. If, you're, if you don't have a, if you can't go and get a salary job, the government doesn't give you um, a safety net, so your only alternative, the alternative of the poor, is to start your own business. Or not even start, but to have your own business. So we look around and there's self-employed everywhere. You walk through the markets, they're all self-employed. You look at the welders, the carpenters, the shoemakers, the tailors, all self-employed. And what we, you know, sort of the obvious occurred to us is that, well, businesses need capital. And so we started, this was the experiment, was we would go up to those that already had a business, see if they could, what they would do with a little extra money, 
and then they would put that money in their business, generate a additional income, and that's how they could pay back the, the loan plus interest. A loan, we, we discovered uh, kind of by accident in the last 20 or 30 years, a loan allows these, these people, many of these people, to, to sort of bring their entrepreneurial talents to the, to the fore and to, to start producing, to start creating wealth. Um, and, and, and that's really the key word, creating wealth. If microcredit doesn't create wealth, then forget it, it's, it's, it's for the birds. This is about fighting poverty and making money at the same time. One could say that's asking for trouble. Yes, uh, one could say that, but you, you kind of make me think of something Churchill said about democracy. I can't put it together uh, sort of literally. I can only paraphrase it. I think he said something like, it's a terrible system, but it's better than all the alternatives. And, and, and I would say the same uh, when you mix capitalism, which is really what you're alluding to uh, with microfinance. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's not pretty. It's very hard to have warm, cuddly feeling about it. But when you see the alternatives, they're worse. The Verenigde Naties roepen 2005 uit tot het jaar van het microkrediet. En in 2006 kreeg de uitvinder van de kleine lening, Mohammed Yunus uit Bangladesh, de Nobelprijs voor de vrede. I call upon the, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate for 2006, Mohammed Yunus, to come forward to receive the gold medal and the diploma. The milestone, um, the, the, the event that changed sort of the earthquake of microfinance was um, in um, April of 2007, five years ago, uh, Compertamos in Mexico did an IPO. They had already been making very large profits. Uh, you know, the, 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 the figure we used, the return on investment, return on equity was over 50% every year, year after year after year for about seven years. How do you do that? Charging women over 100% and making very large profits, 50% uh, again. And so that, that's what got the attention of the investment world. And so th a very different kind of money started to flow in, might even argue, flood into microfinance. Compartamos Banco, tu especialista en microfinanzas. Compartamos originally started off as a, as a, as a charity organization receiving donor funding um, from in, a number of institutions, but in particular USAID and Axion, the American microfinance network. Um, and as the institution grew, at a certain point, it decided to transform, as it's called in the sector, into a for-profit company. And this is, a, this is a common trick used by microfinance institutions, that they start off as a small charity, serving the poor and, and presenting themselves as, an, as, a, as a normal charity. And they receive donor funding, and when they reach a certain scale, it, they are able to convert give shares to the various donors or investors or in many cases senior management and become a for-profit company and realize all the gains that they had made as an NGO suddenly effectively becomes privatized. And Compa Thomas is one of the first examples of that. The microfinance bank in uh, Mexico called Compa Thomas went public and the founders became millionaires and other organizations made millions of dollars. Most of those organizations were non-profit. There weren't nobody. But um, it still was very controversial that all this money was being made, ultimately, off of poor people. What they did was an IPO, and again, the, the, the secondary IPO means that instead of doing it to raise money to put into the institution to then have more resources and grow, it was a cash-out IPO. The money went out into the pockets of, of private individuals and the, the original stockholders. The total worth of the, of the company the day of the IPO was over two billion U.S. dollars. Now, in the year 2000, when they created Compartamos, they put in a total of six million U.S. dollars of equity. In 2000, it was six million dollars. In 2007, it went from six million to two billion. It's over a 300 to one return on investment. Again, a cash out IPO. So I put in, you know, I put in a million dollars, okay, um, in 2000. And then I wait um, seven years, and then all of a sudden my million dollars is worth 300 million dollars. That's the day that microfinance really changed. Um, we, drew, we drew the attention 
of a very different audience, a funder, funding source. We were barely on the radar prior to that IPO, and after the IPO, sort of every investment bank was forming a committee to explore and, and investigate what, you know, where, where's the next Compartamos. What do we find in country after country after country is that the market starts to saturate. You end up with a larger and larger number of MFIs loaning in the same towns, the same villages, loaning to the same people. And you find study after study of clients taking on more multiple loans, okay? Um, I don't even, I, I don't blame them. We, we have a growth mentality. We, the institutions all wanna double their number of clients each year. And the, the institution across the street and down the street also are looking at doubling their clients every year. So we tell our loan officers, go out and put, put more money, put more loans out there. Whether you're poor or whether you're rich, if somebody offers you a loan and you're short of money, you're going to take it. And if, I mean, this, uh, look, look, at, look at the uh, banking crisis here, look at the uh, credit card uh, sort of bubble, you might call it, uh, that we have here in Europe is it's not much different. Uh, th that's just part of human nature. If lenders are eager to lend to you and uh, sort of push the money down your throat, you're not going to close your mouth. You're, 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 you're going to take it. I would see women uh, coming into the institution often illiterate. They didn't understand really what they were doing. They would sign the contract with a fingerprint because they couldn't read and write. And they would receive a loan which was apparently going to help them out of poverty. But um, at the interest rates which they were being charged, there was, there was very, little, very little likelihood of this actually happening in practice, unfortunately. I do worry with credit because, as we know, credit is a very dangerous thing. Within one area, you know, say um, the state of Andhra Pradesh in India, a whole lot of microfinance institutions almost racing each other to see how fast they could grow, right? And so for, uh, I, I met some villagers, in, you know, outside of the capital of Andhra Pradesh, which is Hyderabad. They told me how a few years ago there were maybe one or two micro lenders in their village. And suddenly that jumped to five because these new, these new people showed up saying, please take our loan. And so a lot of people were wise enough not to take a loan, but some did. And some used them in ways that made it very difficult to pay back, like if they bought a television. Not all, but some. And so that meant that there's some percentage of people who um, made, made poor choices because of the easy money and then w were put under a lot of stress. That evening, I poured kerosene on myself and I was about to light a match. My husband broke the door and stopped me. There was commotion. The neighbors came around and consoled us. They said we shouldn't have taken so many loans. Dying wouldn't solve our problems. They told us to think of our two children. That night, my husband and I had a big quarrel. We didn't even have dinner. The next morning, he took the buffalo to the field at 6 a.m. and didn't return for lunch. My father-in-law and I went to look for him. We found him hanged from a tree. He was dead. India is very well documented. Um, you know the stories of the, the suicides. Um, one of the worst that I've seen details on you know, is that you know, she commits suicide by dousing herself in kerosene, lighting on fire. Her husband sees her. Husband tries to tries to cover and put it out, and his he he's killed too. And, and the kids lose both parents in a matter of minutes um, because of the, because of over indebtedness. Bueno, vea, nosotros estamos aquí en Río Blanco con este tranque porque eh, ya se aprobó una ley de las microfinancieras, ¿verdad? Donde ellos supuestamente dan por terminado este problema. Y nosotros estamos de acuerdo con la ley porque de aquí para allá regula al sistema financiero y sobre todo a las donaciones sin fines de lucro. Sin embargo, la ley regula de aquí para allá. Pero recordemos que durante 16 años estas financieras no estaban reguladas por el Estado y cometieron una serie de abusos, como los altos intereses, lo que es la, la, la mora, todo, pues lo que nosotros sabemos, la, el desalojo de propiedades. Es siempre muy peligroso 
if there's too much money around. Uh, in microfinance at the moment, there is too much money. Uh, if, if microfinance institutions have easy access to very cheap money, uh, too much of it, uh, it, it simply seduces them into becoming less and less cautious uh, in lending. We shouldn't just blame microfinance institutions, we also need to blame ourselves. As donors, when we give money to charities, we are creating an evolutionary environment that rewards certain kinds of storytelling and exaggeration and penalizes realism, right? And so we need to change how we give money and demand evidence, not just good stories. There's four billion people living on less than $2 a day. That's the vast, that's two thirds of the world's population. And the rich are very small, the very pinnacle of this pyramid. Some of what is happening in microfinance right now is a transfer of wealth not, you know, not the old school help the poor, send money down to the bottom pyramid. We see a transfer of wealth from the bottom of the pyramid up to the very, very, very top 1% of the pyramid. The rich getting richer off the very poorest in the world. Is it ethical to make profit on helping the poor? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I, I, have, I have no doubt about that because um, because the emphasis here is on helping the poor as long as you help them. Uh, then it's a win-win situation. The, the, the essential thing is that it be a win-win situation. Uh, th that is not one person exploiting another for his own benefit. When does it become unethical? Where do you draw the line? Uh, it's not a line. It's, 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 it's a broad sort of gray band, uh, which is fairly, which is quite hard uh, to draw. Um, I, can, uh, I can't draw it, but I, I intuitively can say, look, if interest rates go way, way up there into the three digits, uh, then we've, we've probably crossed the line. So I flew down to Nigeria and discovered an institution which was charging extremely high interest rates. It was suffering a very high level of client desertion. Clients were simply just leaving the institution after one, maybe two loans. The institution was in a complete chaos, it had no internal control, no governance. It was run by a small group of family members, uh, in all, all from that region of Nigeria. The computer systems that are designed to cope with the high volume of transactions and, and retain some sort of order within the institution were, in, for all practical purposes, did, did not really exist. Um, it was a, a completely chaotic institution, and with very little poverty impact. LAPO berekent kosten die kunnen oplopen tot wel 144 procent. Een arme Nigeriaan die 100 euro leent is een jaar later dus 244 euro kwijt aan rente en aflossing. Hoe leg je dat nog uit? Vragen we aan Theo Bauma van Oxfam Novit, de goede doelenorganisatie die van 2005 tot 2010 zaken deed met LAPO. Op het moment dat wij met een organisatie in zee gaan die leningen wil geven aan arme klanten, dan is een van de eerste zaken waarop wij het oog richten uh, de hoogte van de rentetarieven. Um, en dan doet het er eigenlijk niet zoveel toe of dat 60 is of 80 of 100 of 140. Nou, voor de klant hij doet moet, dat er wel toe. Hij, hij moet naar beneden. Nou, ja, maar laat me even mijn verhaal afmaken. Natuurlijk is dat een belangrijke factor. Kijk, als je kijkt naar Nigeria, want daar speelt de discussie, ook in die tijd speelde die heel sterk. Uh, wat je probeer je in de situatie in te leveren van zo'n arme klant. Die, heeft een, die, die wil investeren.